When you think of space shooters on the NES, you probably tend to think about stuff like this. I know I do, so imagine my pleasant surprise when I bought Solar Jetman completely on a whim and found it to be something quite different. Made by Zippo Games for Rare back in 1990, Solar Jetman is an interesting little game, and actually the third game in its series, although in all honesty I've never played the other two, so I'll be judging this one without reference to them. You play the part of a rather jolly looking spaceman, who is on an interstellar quest to find the pieces of something called the Golden Warship. The aim of the game is quite simple. Once your mothership has landed on one of the 12 different planets you'll be visiting, you launch in your little blue pod to explore the interiors of said planets to find the part of the aforementioned golden mothership that lies somewhere deep within, as well as enough fuel to get to the next planet, and then drag all of that back to the mothership. Obviously, the objective isn't what I find interesting about this game. It's basically just a series of giant fetch quests. The interesting thing about Solar Jetman that I think stands it out from other space games on the NES is its physics. Solar Jetman uses a basic simulation of Newtonian physics, which simulates inertia and gravity. For those of you who don't know, inertia is the tendency of any object to resist a change in its velocity, the tendency of an object to keep going in a straight line. It's the reason why you have to wear a seatbelt when driving to stop yourself flying out the car window when you slam the brakes on, to avoid granting the death wish of the fucking moron that ran out in front of you. This means that the controls are a little bit more in-depth than your average space shooter. Acceleration is provided by a tiny thruster on the back of the pod. To get moving, you simply point the pod where you want to go by rotating until you're pointing the right way, and then light up the thruster until you move and have achieved the desired speed. However, if you need to change direction, say to go in the complete opposite direction, you can't just point it that way and instantly go, as you might be able to in other NES-based games. Because the game simulates inertia, you have to fire the thruster long enough to provide enough force in the opposite direction to cancel out your current velocity, and only then can you get going along the other way. That was a pretty simple example, more often than not you'll have to complete somewhat more intricate manoeuvres, but I'm sure you get the idea. And complicating things just a little further is the fact that the game simulates gravity, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It attracts your little space pod to the ground as you fly, with the strength of the pull depending on that particular planet's gravity rating. The higher the number, the bigger the pull, which makes stable flight that little bit more tricky, so you have to compensate for that as well. The game's level designs are actually quite good, and generally take full advantage of the game's physics system, giving you plenty of open spaces to fly around, as well as more narrow spaces and twists and turns to test your skills, as well as a few obstacles here and there. I especially like these gravity orbs that attract or repel you depending on their colour. But do be careful. The spaces within the interior of the planets are often rather cramped. It's all too easy to get a bit enthusiastic and apply too much thrust in one direction or the other, resulting in you bouncing off a wall because you're carrying too much momentum resulting in damage, so you really have to be quite careful what you're doing. Learning the physics system of this game is absolutely essential to enjoying it. Lifting cargo is also quite a challenge as well. When you find an object, be it a piece of the golden warship, fuel or some other useful goodie, you have to move into a position near it and allow a tether to grab it, and then you can pull it along. But be careful because you also have to deal with the inertia of the object in question in addition to your own. So, as it swings around, it may also end up dragging you along with it if you're not careful. This is also where the gravity simulation comes into its own. It isn't really hard to compensate for gravity in normal flight. In fact, once you're used to it, you'll barely notice its effects at all, on all but the most gravity-heavy of worlds. But when you start towing an object, it also pulls down on the object, which means you have to work quite hard and often make good use of the boost thruster to avoid being dragged back down. Oh, and did I mention that you have limited fuel with which to do all these manoeuvres, so you have to be careful not to piss your fuel tank away, or make sure you find a fuel can lying around. Or you'll end up being reduced to flying around in a little spacesuit with a pea shooter. And if he gets killed, then you lose a life. Of course, if you can get back to your mothership, then you'll get a new pod for free, or you can find them here and there in the wild. Now, the simple simulation of these basic forces makes what would otherwise be a very simple treasure hunt quite a challenge turning this game into a game that's about mastery of its physics, more than it is simply about getting objects to the mothership. It sounds like a pain in the ass to learn how to play this game, but although the game does demand a fair bit of you, and presents quite a good challenge, it isn't really that hard to get to grips with it. You might find it confusing at first, and you'll probably spend a lot of that first stage floundering around, bouncing off every wall in sight, but by the time you finish it, you'll find it's actually not as hard as you first thought, 
and suddenly you'll be navigating narrow spaces just as easily as the wide open ones, and it is an absolute joy to do once you've got the hang of it. This might be a good time to mention the upgrade system. Every couple of stages or so you'll be presented with an item shop where you can spend the points you accumulate from killing things and gathering the little treasures scattered about the levels. The fact that you can actually put those points to use, as opposed to only being there so that you can brag to your friends about your high score, is pretty awesome in itself. But some of the upgrades are actually quite useful in making things easier on you. You can buy additions like uh, efficient engines, or weapons like enhanced bullets, cluster missiles and heat-seeking missiles, which, although some of them are a little too random for my liking, they do make combat a bit easier, though nonetheless frustrating. I'll go into that in a second. You can also get hold of stuff that is always active, and sometimes quite essential, like a booster, which gives you a significant thrust boost at the cost of fuel, a shield, and a map, which you can access via the selection button when paused, which highlights the locations of objects nearby. I found most of these in the wild for free anyway, but if you miss them, it's nice that you can still go and get them. You can even ditch that boring old blue pod entirely, and buy a new pod with better performance, which although not essential, is pretty nice and gives you a little extra something to work towards. So, I think it's obvious at this point that I think Solar Jetman is a good game. But I say good rather than great because, well, for starters, although the game is good, it's hardly classic material, let's be honest, because it's essentially a series of fetch quests. And, well, fetch quests aren't really all that fun anyway. Most of the enjoyment in this game is derived from the excellent physics. That aside, though, it doesn't help that there are a few design decisions that I feel let the game down. The issues I've picked out are actually fairly minor in and of themselves, and there aren't all that many of them, but this is one of those cases where together, the dodgy design issues feel like they go quite a long way towards bringing the game down a couple of notches. To start with, after the first couple of stages, planets become far too large to make dragging items back to the mothership all that practical, so little portals have been provided, which you can just dump items into, to be transported to the mothership. However, many of these are placed in such a way that actually getting cargo into them is really awkward and annoying. And when I said that some of the planet's interiors are quite cramped, some of them are way too cramped, to the point that you have no choice but to just use your ship's shields to bounce you through them. Though I think the biggest issue by far, and I feel this is what drags the game down the most, are these little assholes. Oh, and these little pricks. Oh, and these little... Oh, you get the idea. Now, the problem isn't that there are enemies in the game who want you dead. I think that they add a little extra challenge, a little extra variety. Other enemies I don't have a problem with. The gun emplacement, some of the larger ones, they're not a problem, and they feel quite welcome. But I think that they went way overboard with the little ones. They aren't really a problem to start with, but after a few stages, these little bastards start to become unbearable. Every time you think you're making progress, I can guarantee you a swarm of these little buggers will come hurtling towards you from all sides, shooting at you or ramming you so that you go bouncing off the walls, thus bringing your progress to a sudden halt, and totally bollocksing up the pace of the game. And more often than not, they'll come at you when you're trying to drag something to the mothership, forcing you to dump the item, kill them, pick it up, drag it a few more meters, and then probably be forced to drop it again and kill another swarm. And it gets really tedious, really fast. It doesn't happen often enough to break the game, but when it does happen, you are going to find yourself groaning a bit. Oh yeah, and last of all, there's the password system. Just look at the size of that fucking thing. That is insane. Don't get me wrong, these issues are not game breakers, but they are a bit annoying. Right, now that I've got my whinging out of the way, all that's left is presentation. And unfortunately, as you can see, presentation-wise, Solar Jetman isn't really up to much. Now, whether it's because they needed all the spare juice they could get to cope with a physics simulation, or they just couldn't be asked, it's not very good looking by the standards of the NES by 1990. The graphics are quite basic, to say the least. Your little blue pod looks alright, I guess, as do the enemies, I suppose, even if it is hard to tell what some of the smaller ones are supposed to be. But the environments are just blank spaces with the same texture in a different colour acting as the cave walls. It does the job well enough, I guess, but it's not exactly a visual treat. As for the music, well, there almost isn't any. There's the title theme, which isn't bad, and a smattering of other little things here and there, but for the most part you're going to be spending this game listening to the sound of your pod's thrusters, your pod bouncing off the walls, and the sounds of those little tiny guns. To wrap things up, 
I have mixed feelings about Solar Jetman, I suppose. The smaller enemies and the other issues I mentioned, they're a pain in the arse, and it does lack in overall variety, since as I said at the start, it's just one big fetch quest. But overall, I do think it's quite a good game. The basic presentation and the little annoyances I detailed may bring it down a few notches, but they don't overshadow the game's awesome physics system. It's not going to be for everyone. If you aren't really into these sorts of physics systems, then this game isn't for you, because you're not going to find much else to like about it. But I think if you are into these sorts of simulations, then it may not be the best game out there. But it'll definitely make a unique addition to your NES collection, and should entertain you for a fair while.